tenth day of the month that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. What do you notice there? Dates. Yep, we get a new time stamp now, which means what? We are now entering the third section of the book of Ezekiel. The second section has ended. The second section, which ended in chapter 19, was the sixth year of Ezekiel's ministry. Now, the book of Ezekiel starts in the 30th year, it says, which is the 30th year of Ezekiel's life, which according to the Old Testament law, uh, Jewish men could not enter the priesthood until they were 30 years old. So we start the book of Ezekiel when Ezekiel is 30 years old. The second section is when he's 36 years old, and that coincides with 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar is destroying Jerusalem. Now we're a year later. We're in the seventh year of Ezekiel's ministry. He's been in Babylon this entire time. So he's 37 years old at this point, okay? And so that's what's going on. Um, now, it says there uh, in, the, uh, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month. Now, if you looked at a calendar, like our modern calendar, January, February, March, April, and then you superimpose that with the Jewish calendar, essentially this coincides with late July. I don't know what it is about Ezekiel, but it's like he always hears from the Lord when it's really hot outside. I can understand that. You know, you can start seeing things if you stay out in the heat too much. But uh, he is literally, by the Holy Spirit's power, uh, receiving this word from, from God Almighty. But this is late July in 585 B.C. So we're a year into the Babylonian captivity. Now keep reading with me. Uh, verse 2, Then came the word of the Lord unto me, that is Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? Let me read that again. Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are you coming to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Wilt thou judge them, son of man? He's speaking to Ezekiel there. Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. <laughs> I, I mean, let's be honest. God's not happy with Israel. And I think that shines through pretty clearly in the book of Ezekiel. Um, he loves them, but he is not happy with them right now at this point in time. And so, I would imagine, uh, you know, I would imagine these elders, when they come to Ezekiel, they're feeling pretty down after nearly, by this point, because they're seven years in, the ones that have been with Ezekiel and with Jehoiachin in Babylon in captivity, they've been there for seven years, so nearly a decade. They're feeling pretty down, and, and they've got no ability to go back home now, because now... Their homes have been completely destroyed. Jerusalem is overrun with Gentiles, so it's not even theirs anymore. It, everything is lost. And so I, I imagine they're feeling pretty blue, and now they come to God. Oh, Lord! Right? Poor, pitiful me. Lord, will you give us a word, just a word? And... I'm sure they were coming to ask when they could get out of time out and go back and play again. The offer, dude, you know, we, Claire keeps our, our little niece on Wednesdays, and there are times when she misbehaves, and so Claire will set her, you know, in time out. And they're itching, itching to get out of time out. Like, oh, this is terrible. I can't handle it. This is, this is the worst thing. And it's just like they're just itching to get out of time out. And that's what's going on here. They're one year into a 70-year sentence. And they can't handle it. And you know why God's allowing them to sit there and time out? Because God has put up with centuries of heartache. It's their turn to pay. And so that's what's going on. And so what does God say? He says, I will not be inquired of by you. Now, um, as you can imagine, when the, when the elders heard this, um, 
they probably did what you and I would do if God said that to us. We'd say, why not? <laughs> why not, God? Especially these guys. Because you got to remember, they have so rejected God, they have so ignored His will, they have so ignored His Word, they have so rebelled, they have forgotten or even just not even known that they are there because of their sin and God is the one that sent the Babylonians to discipline them in this regard. And so they just can't understand why God is so mean. How can a loving God be this mean? Have y'all heard this from people before? Well, maybe in the words of the great philosopher Michael Jackson, you need to take a look at the man in the mirror. That's another song, Leaf. <laughs> I, need to, I need to moonwalk up here, you know. Uh, it's time to look at the man in the mirror. Maybe if you do a little inspection, you'll see you are the reason. <laughs> and so that's what's going on. Now, in, in no uncertain terms, it, it's really as if God's going to reply now. You know, Funny you should ask me why I won't respond to you. I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you why I am not going to talk to you. Why you cannot inquire of me. Alright? And so, now, what we're, we're going to read is a, is a bit, this will be a bit lengthy, but I think it's worth reading without, you know, a whole lot of stops in between because... It sort of gives us a panoramic view of Israel's history and, and just some high points where God says, well, here's a couple reasons why you can't inquire of me. Okay, um, And so let's read uh, beginning in verse 5. And say unto them, he's saying to Ezekiel to say this to these elders, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seat of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. And let me pause here because I can't pass this up. This is just a little too rich for me to leave behind. Notice there, God says, I chose Israel. Okay? This is a bit of a side topic, but I think one worth exploring for just a second. I honestly believe the reason why so many people fall for the ideas of Calvinism, this idea of God selecting some to be saved, selecting some to be condemned, giving this favored group you know, this wonderful thing and this unfavored group, a terrible thing. I think the reason why so many people fall for that kind of ideal is really, here it is, it's based on the Bible. What does your Bible read there in verse 5? God chose Israel. Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. Listen, it is a biblical concept that God chose Israel. Now hold up. Before everybody freaks out. <laughs> All right. The truth that God chose Israel, God did choose to make Israel elevated. I don't think we can deny that. He even entered into a covenant with them at Mount Sinai and said, I will make you above all the peoples of the earth. I mean, that's literally what he said. So, he chose them. But here's the catch. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, what has tended to happen in modern times, especially since the time of John Calvin and all of his theology was unleashed on the world, if you don't rightly divide, then what you will think is that the church today is Israel's replacement. And if we are Israel's replacement, we are the frozen chosen. Okay? That's what tends to happen. But let me ask you a quick question. To your knowledge, 
Does the Bible ever indicate that God predetermined that the unchosen would spend an eternity in the lake of fire? Can you find somewhere where God predetermined that some individuals that He chooses will spend an eternity in the lake of fire? I'm giving y'all time to think. Because sometimes when I'm just talking and talking, it's noise. Isn't it, Rita? I think usually they use the potter and the clay and the pots made for honor versus just mm. Usually they do that, but it doesn't mention the lake of fire. Whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. And it's a total misrepresentation of that passage, as we learned back when we were doing our study of Romans, right? But no, no, no. It applies to those two. <laughs> but isn't the Bible clear, though, on the other hand, isn't the Bible clear that God has provided a way in every single generation for man to be saved? Isn't that true? You go back to the Garden of Eden. You carry for it all the way even to the Tower of Babel and the flood and all this stuff and just keep on going all through time. And in every generation of history, guess what? God has provided a way of escape, a plan of salvation on His terms every single time. Has He not? So, although it is true God chose Israel, we have to balance it with the whole of Scripture and the other truths in Scripture. For example, go with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. We've looked at this verse before. And I consider this in my commentary, if you will, which take it with a grain of salt, to be in my estimation of the book of Ezekiel a theme verse or a, a purpose for the, for the prophecy and the things that Israel is going through. Look with me at Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. God says to Ezekiel, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God... I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye choose to die? Why will ye die, O house of Israel? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. Verse 8. At the start of this verse, God is talking about the doom which will occur to Israel's punishers, okay? And it says, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and what? And my salvation from what? How long is that going to last? As long as there's generations. Okay? Y'all do know at some point, God will not offer any salvation to anyone. Do you know why? Because either everybody will have been saved, or they'll be condemned. But everybody will be in their final place. Where either you, can, uh, you will either have no need for salvation, or you cannot. So as long as humanity is generating, <laughs> which will not last forever, God has a plan of salvation for every generation. There's no excuse. There's just no excuse. So that was a little bit off topic, I know. When we come back to Ezekiel over there, verse 5, I couldn't, couldn't pass that up, uh, chapter 20, verse 5, uh, where he says, I chose uh, Israel. 
Keep reading now. Uh, it says, uh, verse 5, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God, in the day that I lifted up uh, mine hand unto them, to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had uh, espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake, uh, forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So remember, God's saying, hey listen, since you've asked... Why I won't answer you, let me just tell you. And so he begins to tell them, Hey, remember that thing, that whole escape from Egypt thing, you know, where I brought you out and then I told you you, you need to get rid of all these others? And what did you do? Nothing that I said. And so here we are. Guess what? You're reaping what you've sown. And so the history of, uh, of Israel is now going to sort of be laid out before us and it started with God delivering them miraculously from Egypt. And He gave them, by the way, notice there um, in uh, verse 6, uh, He gave them this promised land which is the glory of all lands, the Scriptures say there. Um, this is pretty incredible. I actually looked this up because I was kind of interested in it. The, the promised land over there goes from the Nile all the way to the Euphrates River. It goes up to the north uh, east corner of the Mediterranean all the way down below Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's a huge chunk of land, the, the whole of what we would call the Middle East. Not just that little bitty sliver, okay, but the whole of the Middle East. And so uh, I looked this up. In that area of the world, it is estimated that 60% of the entire Earth's oil reserves are located in that region. It is also the region of the world that has the wealthiest people known to mankind in that region. And you know why? They got that oil. They are sitting literally on the gold mine. Okay? Um, that's not to mention copper and all these other natural resources over there. That's not to mention the beauty of it. I, I don't know if any of y'all have ever traveled to Israel. I haven't. I've had relatives and friends that have. I've seen pictures uh, along the coastline there of the Mediterranean. Some of the most beautiful property in the world. Now, it doesn't seem that way when we look at it because it seems like we always see pictures with missiles flying through the air <laughs> these days. Okay? Uh, there's a biblical reason for that too. But... Nonetheless, it is some of the most fertile area. And so when, when God, he was, I mean, he was so going above and beyond for these people. He had given them, I mean, just lavished on them such excess. Hey, we would say he spoiled them. Spoiled them rotten. It's still theirs. They're just not getting to enjoy it the way he intended for them to enjoy it. Much like the Garden of Eden was intended to be enjoyed by Adam and Eve. Okay? Um, just a, an incredible wealth there. And God gave them to enjoy this thing that He gave them. He really just gave them three simple commands. Number one, get rid of the idols. Can't have those. With that, rule number two, worship God alone. How hard can it be, right? Get rid of the idols, worship God alone. And then number three, obey His rules. And really, the main rule that he really points out, as you're going to see here as we continue in Ezekiel 20, is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. How hard can it be to take a nap on the seventh day? I can tell you, I struggle with that one. It is hard to sit down and do nothing, right? It's hard to do it. And so, that's really that simple. Come with me to verse 8. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake uh, that, it should be, uh, that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them in uh, bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. Hey, do you think God was only, His heart was only for the nation Israel? Or do you think God also had a heart for Gentiles even back then? 
Huh? He did destroy He did. You know, he wanted Israel to be the star of the show, but so that the Gentiles in the audience watching the movie would weep for joy and come flocking to what they had. He had a plan of salvation even for Gentiles then. But they dropped the ball. This increased God's anger because it wasn't just that Israel dropped the ball on their own behalf, but on our behalf. So there's a lot of anger involved here. Verse 10, Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Uh, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. All right, let's look at the Sabbath thing real quick. Hold your place there in Ezekiel chapter 20 and go back with me to Exodus chapter 20. I mean Exodus chapter 31, excuse me. Exodus chapter 31. It, it's not really that complicated. And, and God's going to explain the reason for the Sabbaths here. But He even said it there in Ezekiel, for a sign unto them. Okay? The, the day of rest was intended to be almost a day of remembrance every single week to just stop, to meditate, and think on, not just whatever you want to think about, but on the goodness and the wonderfulness of God, the awesomeness of God, and His provision to Israel. How hard can it be? Again, but nonetheless, they drop the ball. But let's see this issue of the Sabbath beginning in verse 12. Exodus chapter 31, verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbaths, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it, that means if they do any kind of work on the Sabbath, that is a defilement. Okay? Certainly if you worship another god on the Sabbath, that is really an abomination. Okay? And so he goes on, he says, verse 14, Ye shall keep the Sabbaths, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days uh, may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout the generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Let me ask you a question. What makes Chick-fil-A famous? It ain't that Christian chicken. Because anybody can make that chicken if they figured out the recipe. But what not everybody does is the Polynesian sauce. Y'all forgot about the Polynesian sauce. See, that was a trick question. I'm kidding. They're closed on Sunday. In the modern world, y'all think about what a contrast that is. Now, I know dispensation of grace, not under law, we're under grace, all this stuff. Does that excuse us from being different? Does that excuse us from having practices that are uniquely Christian or biblical, should I say, that can, in fact, communicate to the world we serve a wonderful God? Right? Well, if they consider what the Sabbath is, yeah. sunset Friday. Sunset. Yeah, they're not necessarily doing it on the right day. And, but yeah, yeah. So you're talking Sabbath opposed to first. That, that's yeah. just a, a, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the Seventh-day Adventists have it right, right? <laughs> as long as they're hitting the right calendar day, we don't really know, right? And so, here's the thing, uh, this was all intended to be a sign. Now what happened for centuries, the Jews rebelled against this, this statute that God had established, requiring them to rest one day out of the week. 
And they just, they didn't do it. They defiled it time and time and time again. And so God said, okay, since you've not only defiled uh, yourselves, but you've defiled my land by doing all this commerce on the day when I told you you're supposed to be resting, I'm going to make sure the land gets a chance to enjoy the Sabbaths that you robbed her of. So I'm taking you out of the land. And you know what? When you're out of the land, the land is going to go, oh. That was a slap in the face of the Jews. You know why? Because it wasn't like suddenly the land didn't have people in it doing commerce. It had Gentiles. Ooh. You're saying the land would rather have them in it than us, the people that are supposed to be there? Yep. You did it. You did it. Again, remember what's going on in Ezekiel. The, these people have leaned and said, God, why not? Why won't you let us inquire? He said, oh, I'm glad you asked. Well, I'll tell you. Come back to Ezekiel now. I'm moving fast because I'm trying to get to a certain passage and here it is. So, beginning in verse 13. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They were designed to give them long life. Uh, and my Sabbath they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake. God keeps having mercy. He keeps having mercy even though they keep messing up. He said, But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Verse 15, Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe your judgments, their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me, they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, well, I'll pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen in whose sight I brought them forth. You see how God was trying to get to the heathen? He was trying to get to the Gentiles and at every phase, the Jews blocked a shot. God continued to have patience, continue to have mercy, give them another chance. Now verse 23, I lifted up my hand unto them also in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries because they had not executed my judgments but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live. And I polluted them in their own gifts in that they call, uh, in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb, that I might make them desolate to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. Now I want to stop here because... I read very quickly through that, and I read quickly through something that if you were paying attention, maybe it caused a flag to go off. And boy, this, this one hit me. When I was writing commentary, this one, it happens multiple times in the book of Ezekiel. It happens multiple times throughout the Bible, but I think it's a very fruitful discussion. Here's the question, though. Here's how I'll frame this. Here's my question. You ready, Rita? Ready. Get ready. ready. Kick it into gear. Shoot. Four low. Here we go. We're getting in the mud. Does God ever commit evil? <laughs> Nobody wants to... Norm was brave. No, 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 I, God leaves people to their own device. Uh, he doesn't have to create evil. Okay. I didn't say create. 
No, he doesn't. Although, we could maybe ask that question too, but does God commit evil? Does He ever commit evil? No. Read it, what do you say? Let me ask the question a different way. What saith the Scriptures? Y'all know when I say that, it's a trick question, right? Y'all know it already. You can feel it coming. But boy, see, I got you feeding out of my hand. Now you've got to have the answer. Well, you'll have to come back next week to get the answer. Totally kidding. Kidding, kidding, kidding. I'm not going to do that. While you're here, got a full house, got to answer this one now. Does God ever commit evil? Come back to verse 25 with me. God is speaking, first person, wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not what? Good. And judgments whereby they should not live. And then the first part of verse 26, And I polluted them in their own gifts, and that they caused to pass through the fire all that, uh, that openeth the womb. Let me ask again, does God ever commit evil? I know how Rita's going to answer. She's going to say, well, that depends on how you define evil. <laughs> Am I right, Rita? Well, I mean, that could be true. <laughs> so, we have to ask, what is the Scripture? Does the Scripture ever say, even directly, that God commits evil? evil exists all the time and simply God allows it to happen. What's interesting though, right here, God is speaking in first person saying, I'm doing this thing. Now hold on, because before y'all think I'm blasphemous and I, I think God is evil, okay, be careful here. Again, this is where we got to take in more information. Because as of yet, we've got incomplete information. And maybe this is the first time in your life you've ever even considered this question or even don't want to consider this question because maybe it will interrupt and disrupt all of your theology. And now here we go, we've got to rewrite everything again. Right? But these are, these are good questions to ask because we can actually get some biblical information here that helps sort some things out. Now, I want you to go back with me to Ezekiel chapter 6. Ezekiel chapter 6 and read verse 10. Let me read it in case you're illiterate. <laughs> that was mean one. I'm kidding. I know y'all aren't illiterate. Here's what it says. And they shall know, this is God speaking, that I am the Lord and that I have not said in vain that I would do, I would do, I would commit this evil unto them. I'll do this evil, God says. Alright, just hang on. Hang on. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Take a right turn. It's the book after Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 9. Don't freak out just yet. Daniel chapter 9, verse 14. Daniel chapter 9, verse 14. Therefore hath the Lord watched... Oh, oh, Rita! Hurry up and turn your pages. You don't give an old person a chance. <laughs> I'm doing evil. <laughs> Oh, Rita. Thank you, Rita. Now, Daniel, what? Chapter 9. Good, <laughs> 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 I know. Look, she's mad at me because I'm saying God's committing evil. Now she's like, now hold on. That's my God you're talking about there. All right. Okay. All right. Are you there? We're, we're, we're going to read verse 14. One, four. All right. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all His works, which He doeth 
for we obeyed not His voice. Let me ask you, does God commit evil? No. What saith the Scripture? Yes. You're coming around. You're coming around. Caleb's going to be my first convert. He's going to be my first blasphemous convert. Now just hold on. I know, I know, I know. we got more questions. Don't worry. Just hold on. Go to Micah. Take a right turn, Rita. Micah. Norm's getting frustrated up here. No, I'm not frustrated. <laughs> Norm's like, you better hurry up and sort this thing out, dude. Do you know what a multiple choice test is? <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is fun for me. I like, this is the kind of stuff when I'm doing Ezekiel says, I'm thinking, Lord, please just give me something <laughs> interesting. Talk about it. Here we go. This is interesting, right? This is interesting. Micah, are you there, Micah? All right, just checking. Chapter 2. <laughs> Micah, chapter 2. And let's, uh, let's read together verse 3. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family, what does it say? What, what does it say? It says, Behold, against this family do I... Who's the I? God. Behold, against this family do I devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. Um, okay, by the way, that's just three passages. There are tons. There are tons. Okay? I want you to go home. I want you to go home and investigate for yourself. Because I just want y'all to investigate this for yourselves because every man needs to be persuaded in his own mind, all that stuff. You don't have to take my word for it. But from what we've just seen from three verses so far, does God commit evil? Let's just start there. I know y'all are smart, and you've already got another question waiting. You're waiting with another question. I wonder if evil is the same as sin. Ah! Do you read my notes? No. Great minds think alike, Rita. You are a genius. <laughs> but don't look we're not at that question yet slow down the question I asked does God commit evil the answer is yes the Bible declares God commits even devises evil now oh, the earth just cracked in half we're all falling in. Now, now everybody's doctrine is all messed up. This is where we have to be careful. Caitlin's over there like, I just started this right division thing, and now you're going to mess me up, dude. <laughs> Caitlin's like, you better hurry up and answer this, right? So, now the question then becomes, okay, let's say I can agree with the Bible that God commits evil. Now, the next most important question is all evil sinful? Now, Rita, you're going to attempt an answer to that, but I don't care. Here's why. Even though I love you, I want to know what saith the Rita? What saith the Scriptures? How do the Scriptures handle the issue of evil? How do the Scriptures define evil? Beverly. I have a question. <laughs> now, I just asked a question. You're going to add another question, Beverly? Okay. Yeah. Come on with it. In I don't the, know. In the original <laughs> language, mm -hmm. are there different twists to evil? No. It's the word raw. And so it just means... Like, raw, raw. Huh? I don't know, Brian. What saith the Scriptures? I think it said harmful. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Now, um, here's what we know. All evil is bad. 
Let me, let me say it like this. All evil is bad. In the sense that you're talking about, Brian, it's, it's bad in the sense that it is it's painful, it's destructive. And yes, God commits destructive things from time to time. I know. Okay. Who sent, who raised the Chaldeans? Who raised the Chaldeans, according to the prophets, to come and destroy Israel? To not just destroy their land and their temple, but to kill them. But is he not using evil as a. You're speeding ahead. You're speeding ahead. Slow down. Yeah, I'm not the one rushing here. You are. Okay. <laughs> right. Here's what you want. I'm, what I'm trying to teach y'all by my behavior. Okay. When you come on these kind of questions like this, take your time and just take it one little bit at a time and let the Bible answer the question. Yes, God commits evil. Is all evil sinful? Okay, we can see countless examples in the Bible where evil is bad. We can see countless examples where evil can be sinful. But guess what? We can see countless examples where, to your point, Rita, that you're now trying to make and you're trying to pivot the conversation, that evil can actually be used as an instrument for... For godliness, for righteousness, for goodness. <laughs> yes, Emma. Doesn't the Bible also say never to do evil that good may come of it? Oh, does it? Yes. Where? In the Old Testament. Where? <laughs> Blue letter Bible, quick, 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 quick. I okay. Now, he, this is, but you see, you see where when we have these kinds of questions. We've got to be careful to be precise, right? Be precise in our thing. Because otherwise, we'll see a passage where it talks about God devising evil, and all of a sudden, if we, equal, if we say that evil equals sin, now what are we saying? God sins. Is that true? How do you know? Huh? It's somewhere in the Bible, right? Somewhere it's in there. Uh, and, and so we got to be careful not to equate that. Come back to Ezekiel chapter 20 real quick. Look at verse 26 again. God says, And I polluted them. He did an act of evil. It was a destructive act. Okay, just start there. And I polluted them in their own gifts in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb. For what purpose though? That I might make them desolate to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. Okay? So, is evil for the sake of destruction and misery God's end game with His usage of evil? No. Never. Never. You, you won't find a single example of that where it's just God being a meanie. Never. I mean, if you, even if you think about the lake of fire, it, that's not God's intention. In fact, we've already all agreed and seen that God in every single generation provides a means of salvation. Right? Right? So, God... Is God being sinful when He causes evil to occur? 
I can't say that. Go with me to Numbers chapter 23 real quick. Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. We... You know, y'all, you could write an entire dissertation on this. I promise you. And and I, this is like just enough to get y'all stirred up, like stir up the hornet's nest, and then we're gonna get out of here. <laughs> Beth was like, "This is not right, Greg. You this you really stepped off the deep end right here." Numbers chapter twenty three. Look at verse nineteen. This is a familiar passage, but just regarding the very character of God, it says, "God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent." Repent of what? It's like turn and change from what? Or from being manlike, which is sinful, right? Um, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? We could go on countless passages speaking of the character of God as perfectly just and righteous and all is holy. It just every one of those applies, right? And so God is not a sinner. He cannot sin, right? And so, we, we just in, in, as we think of the logic, if God commits what the Bible characterizes as an evil act, when He does it, it is not an act of sin. Why? Because His character will not allow it. He cannot. So, in every situation where we see evil being committed by God... It is always to the end for godliness, for righteousness, for His glory. Acts 17. Uh -huh. Yep. 1730. Acts 1730. Is that the one Emma brought up? Mine was actually in Rome. <laughs> you mean to tell me? I'm kidding. Uh, Acts, Acts 17. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. This is good. Hey. It may not apply as you think, but uh, right. when you look at it, when it says God winks at yes. what's going on, yeah. that meant that there was a, there was something that was there that was created and yep. was allowed. Accepting what verse did you choice. say? Okay. Seventeen thirty. Seventeen thirty. Thirty. Verse thirty. Acts seventeen verse thirty. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Yeah. Gave a nod to it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's so here's what we what, here's what has developed in this conversation. Okay. Um, we need to be careful that we don't assume evil equals sin. That is certainly not always the biblical sense. Okay. You think about today, if there's a hurricane, hurricane blows through a region and just destroys, destroys all kinds of property, people are killed, whatever the case may be, okay? That is considered an evil, a bad thing, destructive, right? Is it sinful? Only when it hits New Orleans. <laughs> Y'all remember that after Katrina? Oh, New Orleans had it coming. Right? So, this is why we have to be careful because in our talking about biblical things, if we're not careful, we can confuse people. We ourselves can be confused about these topics. And we have to be able to faithfully and honestly handle these verses that talk about God committing evil. Pretty interesting. This is literally, and I do mean this just to sort of crack open a can of worms, but I am not going to address this today. I'm just telling you on the front end. When you think in those terms, a question that always seems to come up is, why did God create Lucifer? That's a can of worms topic, right? But when you start taking into account the nature of God and the scriptural account of his actions and his motives. <clears throat> what you start to realize, at least I do, is it's going to take us an eternity, 
of spending time with God to just figure it out how amazing He is. Like it is, it is mind boggling what He knows and just how He is. He, he is God. It's incredible. Is Israel the only one he committed evil toward? <clears throat> That's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. Because I know that at one point he, mm-hmm. he let he gave Gentiles over to their own devices. Yeah. So I didn't know if that there was. A yeah. Place. So. Yeah, and my first inclination is to say, no, they weren't the only ones because, for example, when He brought Israel into the Promised Land, what did He do ahead of them? He drove out the heathen. That included, by the way, a lot of, a lot of murder, a lot of death. If you think about the Passover, for example, um, on the night of the Passover, what did the angel of death do? Murdered a whole bunch of people that were not Israel, right? And so... Um, that is an evil, but it's not with the end game, the final being. You know, nobody can ever have it any better or anything like that. You know, it, it, that's not the final game for God ever. It's not evil for the sake of evil, and that is one of the things that distinguishes Satan from God. Right? Satan is—he's always got a motive of evil. That is always his end game. Right? And so it's just a very—it's—it's it's just a—it is a boy. It's a deep topic there, that one, uh, one that I want you all to continue to consider and think about. And so, um, think of it in these terms, if you will, when we think of evil being an instrument. Let's say I, I take a shovel. A shovel is an instrument, isn't it? Now, what could I do with a shovel? That's one thing. Rita? Jonathan? Jonathan, what? Jonathan, what can I do? Well, I, I, he, went, he went, pow! Which, uh, let me interpret. He would say, you can play baseball with it. Yeah, so that's what you meant. You could knock somebody over the head with it. You could dig yourself out of a hole. You could dig the foundations for a house. You could... What could you do with a shovel? It is an instrument. Your motive for the use of that instrument matters. You know, I've done evil to my kids before. When I spank them, it is quite destructive. Would you call that tough love? I I just call it love. I don't like it. You think God enjoyed what was going on in Ezekiel? Do you think He enjoys what's going on now in the world? Do you think He's going to enjoy? Do you think God is just itching for the tribulation to happen? He just can't wait to just unleash evil on the world. No, He's been holding off for 2,000 years. I'm very confident God does not commit evil for the sake of evil. His motive is pretty doggone powerful. And it's pretty worth our investigation of the Scriptures to discover this God that we call awesome. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Emma's still, she's still thinking on that Romans passage. Okay. I want you to continue to think on that topic. Because it is. And I'm not saying I have like, you know, answered all doubts or answered all questions or answered all Scriptures. But it was one that occurred to me when I was not only writing, but it popped up again there in chapter 20. I thought, you know, a lot of people probably are thinking about this kind of question. It's probably worth noting and bringing to your attention and and thinking on. So, that's all I got for y'all today. Let's pray. Read this laughing at me. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the study of your word. And uh, God, I pray that ultimately through, through our study of Your Word that we will over and over again rediscover Your power, Your glory, Your righteousness, Your mercy, Your patience, Your love. On and on we go. 
And, and Lord, this is just what, what we're learning here right now on this earth is just a primer for what we're going to spend in eternity discovering about You. Lord, uh, thank You that You've given us these little morsels along the way just to sort of whet our appetite and to draw us in closer, to make us curious, to make us ask questions, to keep us coming back and drawing from this well of truth. Lord, we love You. We are so grateful for Your Word. And it is in Your name that we pray. Amen. Y'all come back, you hear?